Um, so vernacular photography, the subject of my paper today, is a category of images that art historian Jeffrey Bachin describes as the, quote, ordinary photographs, the ones made or bought by everyday folks from 1839 until now, the photographs that preoccupy the home and the heart, but rarely the museum and the academy, end quote. Vernacular photographs are the pictures of vacations, holidays, and birthday parties taken with inexpensive point-and-shoot cameras and carefully pasted into albums or stored in shoeboxes. Vernacular photography utilizes a standard set of poses, gestures, arrangements, and subjects, which co what comprise what I will call its visual conventions. Within the domestic archive of the photo album or the shoebox, vernacular photographs are often informally inscribed with names, locations, and dates to further connect an image to a specific person, place, or event. This form of writing, usually mere snippets of text, relies heavily on the photographs to transform their condensed syntax into meaningful signs. And without the brief annotations, such details would almost certainly be lost in the passing of generations and travels across borders. Conversely, without the visual representations, the writing on the reverse of a photo or on the pages of a photo album becomes difficult to interpret as a meaningful part of collective memory. Although the informal notes scribbled on the backings of photographs, or in this case on the front, um, are quickly being replaced by the virtual tags, captions, and keywords attached to digital photographs online, such writing is still common enough to be considered another visual element of the image an expected uh, visual convention of the form. The writing reveals a desire to conform to the social and cultural expectations imposed on the collective memory of a family or group, which include remembering the shared places, dates, and names of those pictured within the photographs. Although the images in their handwritten notations represent personal memories, because of the visual conventions of the form, we recognize the impulse to informally record the names and dates of those pictures. We do it too. I'm assuming everyone has images like this uh, of their own at home or at their parents' homes. Through the recurring captions, often inscribed, reinscribed, and modified over time, family albums can lose their particularities and ambiguities to become part of the infrastructure of popular memory, which works to reinforce a sense of national and cultural identity. The recognition of captions as a conventional practice in vernacular photography furthers the sense of affiliation with the images and collects them to, connects them to the larger collective memory of a cultural group. As an element of vernacular visual conventions, handwritten captions on a photograph are a critical part of the assembly and articulation of cultural identity and collective memory. In the context of the Dominican diaspora in the United States, vernacular photographs in circulation communicate collective memory across time and across geographic distance. Through writing on family photographs, the diasporic domestic archive constructs familial and cultural narratives constantly in trans transit between the Dominican Republic and the United States. The discourse of vernacular photography, communicated through its visual conventions, is legible to Dominicans in both the United States and in the Dominican Republic. The shared visual discourse is the basis of collective memory. A black and white photograph of Asistentes al Botido de la Hija is a compelling example of the ways in which vernacular photographs and their handwritten annotations contribute to a sense of collective memory and identity in circulation between the Dominican Republic and the US diaspora. The photograph pictured here reveals a large group of people closely gathered together on a small outdoor patio under a canopy of trees. Forming a tight half circle, most of the people pictured, guests at the celebration of a baptism, lean forward or twist around in order to come into sight of and face the camera's lens. A few subjects are seen in profile, either captured in conversation or glancing across the room. The top left-hand corner of the image was torn at some point and carefully repaired with cellophane tape and the tear is now yellowing along the seams. The surface of the image has also been damaged. Scrapes, stains, and faded spots mar a few areas, and the faces of some subjects are largely hidden by the damage. While the image itself features many of the visual elements and subject matter typical of vernacular photography, what I, what I call <coughs> its visual conventions, uh, the, fa um, sorry. 
The back of the photograph also reveals a wealth of information about the social and cultural expectations of such images. The reverse of Asistentes al Bautizo uh, features a detailed handwritten list of all of the guests at the baptismal celebration. The lengthy caption uh, records and enumerates the given names, nicknames, and familial roles of the guests as they appear in the image from left to right, differentiating between the seating, seated and the standing to ensure correct identification. A short note jotted in the lower right-hand corner in the same handwriting also confirms the date and the occasion for the gathering. The rent on the front of the photograph is mirrored on the back, also patched with tape that is yellowed enough to partially obscure some of the text. Due to its age and the damage of the photograph, the text and the image are both requ required for complete identification of the uh, guests, preserving the evidence of those who were present at this important social event. The documentation of all of the guests in the photograph, done with such careful precision and attention to detail, reveals the close connection between the informal captions on vernacular photographs and the desire to articulate and preserve familial and, on a larger scale, collective cultural memory in the diasporic archive. The photograph Asistentes al Bautizo, with its extensive writing, also reveals another aspect of what visual studies scholar Marian Hirsch terms the familial gaze. In vernacular family photographs, there are actually multiple intersecting gazes that position the subjects, family, friends, lovers, community members, in relation to one another and, importantly, to various other external gazes, both in the past and in the present. It is at this intersection of gazes that we participate as viewers, as we desire and impose a sense of affiliation with otherwise disparate vernacular images. The familial look is also, quote, structured with the need for the look to be returned. The look of recognition secures one's own identity within the collective memory of the family and the group represented, end quote. The attendees at the baptism celebration eagerly position themselves before the camera's lens in order to display themselves for identification within the group photograph. The returned look of the familial gaze confirms the domestic relationships and the individual's own identities within the social group. The handwritten annotations on the reverse of the photograph function in a similar way simultaneously validating familial relationships among the subjects through notes like Mercedita, Nieta de Mercedes Rosa, and reaffirming specific identities, as suggested by the sobriquets like Pancho, a familiar form of Francisco, and El Cabito, a nickname indicating or meaning the little end of something or a stub. <laughs> Without the handwritten captions like these on vernacular photographs, such aspects of familial and collective memory would be lost within the domestic diasporic archive. As part of the returned look of recognition engendered by the familial gaze, the writing on vernacular photographs reveals the desire to articulate aspects of identity within the larger collective memory of the Dominican diaspora in the United States. The carefully inscribed inventory of guests at a baptismal celebration reveals the importance of such informal captions in the articulation and preservation of collective memory. The list of partygoers' names, however, is not the only text to consider on the back of Asistentes al Bautizo. The reverse of the image has been reinscribed at least twice since the in initial notations were made. Once with an X and the brief remark Muerto next to Fabio Paulino's name, and again in the lower left-hand corner with the note Amigos acepto por pura. Uh, friends welcomed by Pura, Paulino. The double reinscription in unknown persons, memorial note, and a later addendum suggests that the captions on a vernacular photograph do not represent the final or authoritative articulation of collective memory. It's always in flux. The domestic archive of vernacular photography has in this case been altered to account for significant changes like death or, in other cases, transnational migration. The revision of textual captions indicates a sense of something initially missed, information or recollections added later that were required to complete the diasporic domestic archive and augment otherwise deficient areas in the collective memory. 
But not all of the absences in the collective memory of the Dominican diaspora in the United States were fully accounted for by handwritten captions or their subsequent revisions. The shifting politics of race as an aspect of identity in the collective memory of the Dominican Republic and its US diaspora is one such absence, a lack that it is difficult to discern in either the textual or visual elements of vernacular photographs. While it is almost impossible to discuss race in the Dominican Republic without immediate, immediately conjuring up its historically contentious relationship with Haiti, as indicated in the triangular formation of a keynote speaker, uh, it's a neighbor on the island of Hispaniola, of course. I concentrate here on the contrasting conception of racial identity experienced by the Dominican diaspora community in the United States. As noted by anthropologist Juan Duani, quote, race is not a fixed essence, a concrete and objective entity, but rather a set of socially constructed meanings subject to change and contestation through power relations and social movements and transnational migration often transforms the cultural definition of racial identity, end quote. Indeed, migration to the United States requires a revision of racial identities for the Dominican diaspora community. In the same way that a handwritten caption on the back of a photograph requires alteration after significant changes. Um, am I speaking loudly enough? Oh, so five minutes. Got it. <laughs> uh, requires alteration after significant changes, aspects of cultural identity and thus collective memory are inevitably, if reluctantly, modified in the wake of transnational migration. Uh, yet, okay, yet changes to racial identity are only subtly, almost indiscernibly, uh, revealed by vernacular photographs and thereby reflected in the collective memory of the Dominican diaspora in the United States. Uh, racial identity in the Dominican Republic is socially negotiated through a complex series of comparative markers, including class status, physical traits, and cultural practices like religion. It's also intimately tied to a sense of national identity based on the historical circumstances of colonialism and slavery. Dominican racial identification occurs on a finely calibrated spectrum, with a plethora of different terms to describe slight variations in skin tone and hair and eye color. In general, in the United States, on the other hand, racial categories are, quite literally, more black and white. But vernacular photographs do not necessarily portray the complex navigation of identity as it occurs in public places like a busy urban street. Rather, they are private and highly oblique means of articulating racial identity in the transitional spaces of the Dominican diaspora. Uh oh. Hmm, okay. Sorry. Shoot. Sorry. <laughs> Two of the images weren't showing up. We'll try again. Hmm. I got nothing. We'll just look at this one for now. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine two black and white photographs. Um, which I will somewhat describe, uh, of the Dominican-American Juan Paulino and members of his family reveal the difficulty in determining subtle revisions of cultural and personal identity through either the textual or visu visual elements of vernacular photographs. The two photographs are visually quite similar, trust me. Both portray the same family group arranged close together in intimate interior settings, the smiling subject's position to face the camera and meet its gaze for maximum vernacular effect. Juan Paulino, the family patriarch, occupies a central position in both images, just as he does here, standing protectively above or tightly embracing his children and spouse. The formal clothing and stylish hairdos, as well as the birthday cake in the image that would have been on the right, suggests that the photographs were intended to capture the memories of a special occasion in the life of the family. The backs of the photographs, dutifully yet concisely inscribed in the lower right-hand corners with the locations and dates of the snapshots, reveal that they were taken about five years apart, one in Santiago, one in New York City. The image's adherence to the visual conventions of family photographs through the standard poses, arrangements, subjects, and captions readily evoke the strong sense of affiliation in the viewer. In addition, the circulation of vernacular photography, evidenced by the earlier image's movement between the Dominican Republic and the United States, encourages the construction of a collective diasporic memory. Yet an absence remains in the photographs and in the diasporic archive, evidence of the shifting conceptions of Dominican racial identity after the experience of transnational migration. 
uh, am I doing? Okay. The feeling of a common social and cultural experience and the ability to picture oneself into another family's uh, snapshots are significant aspects in understanding vernacular images as a formative element of the collective memory of a cultural group. But such photographs also conceal important absences in this diasporic archive, like the potential revision of identity caused by transnational migration. The lack of explicit references to the revision of racial identity within an image belies the actual difficulties faced by the Dominican diaspora community in the United States. Vernacular images like the snapshot of the Paulino family are important because they visually represent collective memory in the context of diaspora. They also subtly challenge the ways in which photographs are used to support discourses of racial difference and discrimination in other re uh, visual representations of Dominicans in the United States. That is, through their conformity to the standard visual conventions of family photography, these vernacular images work to undo or counteract negative racial discourses around migration and difference. As a basis of collective memory, the images can also be a source of cultural pride and great pleasure for the diaspora community. In writing about representations of African Americans, cultural critic Bell Hooks has noted that, quote, the camera became, in black life, a political instrument, a way to resist misrepresentation, as well as a means by which alternative images could be produced. Producing images with the camera allowed black folks to combine image making in resistance struggle with a pleasurable experience." End quote. Vernacular photography similarly empowered the Dominican diaspora community of the United States through the subtle resistance to negative racial discourses. Uh, as a form of visual self-representation, photography also functioned as a medium of self-examination for a community whose identity was in flux. So skipping ahead to a conclusion. Uh, Juan E. Paulino, pictured here with his family, was actually the first person to donate his personal papers and family photographs to the Dominican Studies Institute archives at the City University of New York. The Paulino archive provides a diasporic counterpoint to Trujillo's self-aggrandizing attempts uh, to revise Dominican identity and collective memory during his regime. An institutionalized collection of cultural records, like the Dominican Studies Institute, promotes a positive feeling about Dominican identity, which, as discussed above, was undergoing a period of transition due to transnational migration. The DSI functions much like a decentered domestic archive of the Dominican diaspora. The DSR archive maintains the photographs, albums, postcards, and every other, uh, other everyday artifacts of individuals and families from the diaspora community in much the same way that families preserve their own collections of images, reinforcing the importance of vernacular photographs in forming collective memory. In both archives, an institutional archive like the DSI and in family archives, vernacular photographs and the handwritten captions they bear offer a specific means for representing the past and constructing collective memory, albeit in a highly subjective manner. Archives of vernacular photography, institutional or domestic, can re reinforce the narratives that come to represent individual and collective memories, but they can also be fraught with absences and revisions that obscure some aspects of life in the diaspora. The visual conventions of vernacular photography, its repeated gestures, subjects, and settings, are crucially important for interpreting meaning in the images. But it is the hand, through the handwritten inscriptions, the later revisions, and even the perceptible absences in archival collections that vernacular photographs ultimately become an essential part of the shared recollections, that is, the collective memory of a cultural group. Thank you. And sorry, sorry about the images. Must be a Mac PC transition thing. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me here. It's the first time I've ever participated at a conference, and I'm honored that it's the one for lessons. Um, so um, this is a work in progress that I'm presenting, and hopefully I will get some useful feedback at the end. Uh, can you hear me well at the back? Okay. So my research project 
uh, situates itself at the intersection of history, critical race theory, as well as visual and cultural studies. By merging these different disciplines, I'm hoping to complicate the understanding of racial thought, not only as a discursive practice, but also as a means of self-representation and resistance. To that effect, I will focus on the artwork of two French visual artists, uh, Thierry Fontaine and Philippe Thomarel, from La France d'Outre-mer, or France um, Overseas territories, territories. So what is so uh, illusory about French culture? Visible minorities, black, black, black France, the failure of assimilation. All these terms are part of a social, po social political discourse that crystallizes the fear of a fragmented society, the loss of an imagined, immutable, and recognizable French identity entirely molded through a schizophrenic and forgetful history. In this angst-inducing context, race is codified into culture. The politique d'intégration or assimilation policies, the depenalization of the French West Indies, failed to make minorities invisible again, confined to an imagined colonial space or to the stage of world exhibits, travelogues, art, and advertising. As suggested by the term visible minorities that emerged in the 1990s, oculocentrism stands at the core of postcolonial subjectivity. The complexity of these issues lies in the failure to reconcile the conceptualization of an imagined unique cultural framework and a civilizing mission, as astutely noted by James Baldwin in No Name in the Street, as he compares French attitudes towards him and Algerians in Paris, I quote, the black American is civilized indeed, but the Arabs were not like me. They were not civilized like me. It was something of a shock to hear myself described as civilized, but the accolade thirst for so long had, alas, been delivered too late, and I was fascinated by one of several inconsistencies. I have never heard a Frenchman describe the United States as civilized, not even those Frenchmen who like the states. Of course, I think the truth is that the French do not consider that the world contains any nation as civilized as France. But leaving that aside, if so crude a nation as the United States could produce so grossly civilized a, creatures, a creature as myself, how was it that the French, armed with centuries of civilized grace, had been unable to civilize the Arab? End of quote. According to film theorist um, and art historian Kadia Silverman, to be is to be seen. The gaze is what brings the other subjectivity into being, for otherness, or to be more accurate, race, inscribes itself on the body through it, no matter how well the imagined French essence is performed. But race is taboo, race is irrelevant. Liberty, equality, fraternity, the French are all equal, and so is their history. The dislocated other is forced to adopt an inflicted uh, Genusian identity, as expressed by Fanon, Luke, and Negro, who is made aware of his otherness through the gaze as, I quote, the white man had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, stories. I was responsible at the same time for my body, for my race, for my ancestors. I discovered my blackness, my ethnic characteristics, and I was battered down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiencies, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships, and above all else, um, yabon banania. How can the colonial, the colonial subject divorce their internalized Frenchness with the suspicious, accusatory gaze of the national whose internalized Frenchness teaches them who belongs to that wonderful brotherhood? What I would like to explore is the expression of otherness through the gaze and a certain cultural, social, and political discourse in order to understand how culture and race are intertwined. And the political race discourse I'm referring to here is our French President Nicolas Sarkozy Hegelian take on African history in 2005, but also the consequence of the Tobira Act, uh, who um, had the state uh, recognized um, French slavery as a crime against humanity in 2001, but also the debate on visible min minorities on television. So the work of visual artist Thierry Fontaine will be crucial to understand how the concept of identity, race, culture and language in particular, dislocation, isolation, visibility, invisibility, 
create a palpable uh, cultural and societal tension that threatens the inner workings of a constructed and seemingly fixed Frenchness. 13 years after the national soccer team saw the illusion of a racial or cultural harmony, and on the eve of presidential elec elections, I believe it is important to reflect on France's inherent and permanent racial uh, identity crisis. So Thierry Fontaine is a French visual artist from La Réunion, an island in the Indian Ocean whose history is marked by slavery and colonization. He was trained as a sculptor at the Ecole um, des Beaux-Arts de Strasbourg. His main medium is photography, but he's also known for his installations. The themes he explores in his work are a social and ethnic identity, isolation, marginalization, and the difficulties of communication and interpersonal relationships. The work of Thierry Fontaine epitomizes the question of Frenchness by exposing and interrogating, interrogating French diasporic and peripheral identities. Furthermore, his art, his art reflects resistance and struggle through uh, Le Cri. Here's an example. Uh, Le Cri series that conveys uh, the colonial subject's muted urge to scream their rage in a space where protest against racial issues is made intelligible by a uh, discourse on equality and racelessness. So I'm going to move to the next um, art work that I would like to focus on. So this object is named uh, Confidence Paris. Um, confidence is the translation in English should be um, secret, secret or a revelation. So what you can, the translation of uh, à Paris, quelqu'un m'a demandé si je parlais français, is in Paris, someone asked me if I spoke French. So, um, does it secrecy uh, denote blame, or shame, or disbelief? Something you can't or won't say out loud? Indeed, it is a written note or a muted scream. It expresses a difficulty to communicate, but also a historical and sociocultural taboo about race and or ethnicity, in the context of the remnants of the French Empire, as well as the state.